the whole world is changing around us in post. And with the advent of Thunderbolt, it kind of changed the way of most of us worked. And you know, Thunderbolt was this pretty much an Apple protocol for a very long time. And starting last year, we started seeing an influx of Thunderbolt technologies on the Windows side. And then this watershed moment happened where the Windows guys got to Thunderbolt 3 before the Mac people did. And now there's this philosophy in the community about, wow, you know, is it Thunderbolt? Is it USB-C? How do I do it? What are the problems? What are the, what, what are the things I need to know? And I just want to talk about the fear factor for a while. And it's like, because it's a new connector does not mean that it's going to change your life unless you haven't ever used Thunderbolt before. And this unifying nature of a single USB-C connection for both USB 3.1.2 protocol or two levels of that in the Thunderbolt 3 protocol, you now have this technology that's enabling you to have a smaller, lighter laptop to be much more efficient, to start doing external GPU processing for accelerated graphics. You've got the ability to do networking via Ethernet on a single cable. And that's one of the things about Thunderbolt that I like to talk about is, is that <clears throat> it enables me to do lots of different things. I can create a shared work group with a single Thunderbolt 3 workstation, even a Thunderbolt 2 workstation. I can create a shared workstation by just attaching two computers, logging in, giving me each other an IP address, and now I have a shared workflow without an extra server, without anything else. I've done it on the C products, I've done it on GTech products, I've done it over Ethernet and everything else because Thunderbolt allows you to do that. It's all of USB-C, it's you know, 10 gig Ethernet, it's data processing, but for post, one of the most important aspects of Thunderbolt is the ability to do DisplayPort. Because if we're talking about HDR, and I don't care what platform you're working on. If you're talking about doing HDR, HDMI is not capable of properly handling the signal. I tested monitors for a couple of large, HDR monitors for a large concern, I can't say who, but we got to it and it was like, okay, the number one plug on these, this $16,000 HDR monitor was an HDMI 2.0. But the, three, four, you know, the two, three, four plugs were all 1.3, one was 1.3, one was 1.4a, and the other was 1.2. It's like, if I tried to get 10 bits of information into an HDMI 1.2 plug, it wouldn't work. I'd only get eight bits. And with this DisplayPort layer, which is a dedicated channel of the Thunderbolt bus, I can now guarantee 10 bits out of my laptop. I can have a 10-bit dedicated pipeline out of my laptop. And, and mini display port in Thunderbolt and Thunderbolt 2, it's easy. You just do a mini display port to um, a display port connection. I actually have a custom cable made from Thunderbolt 3 to display port. You can now buy them from companies like StarTech and Belden. So now I can plug in directly from my Mac, directly from my PCs. I have a, um, an XP360X Spectre. It's got two Thunderbolt 3 ports on it. Folds into a tablet on one side, ultra, ultra small. So I can take this incredibly small platform and then plug it into external GPU processing, high speed data networking. Uh, I can tap into 10 gig ethernet networks if I'm at a broadcaster, uh, or I can tap direct attached storage and be able to maintain speeds beyond two gigabytes a second. This is a new level of technology for us in post, and it allows the devices to be so much smaller. I mean, it allows the laptops to be smaller. It allows the connectivity to be quicker. I mean, I, I can have a thinner laptop because the USB spec only allows for a one millimeter high plug. Now, we can start doing what we've always wanted to do, be mobile warriors. I want to be a road warrior. I want to carry it on the road. I want to be able to work on my laptop or my, my tablet anywhere and then get back to my desk and plug in you know, Ethernet processing and high-speed data and everything else and then take the concept that I've built on a limited device and expand it to the way we used to do with workstations. It gives us workstation level power for a mobile society. And, and it's important for people to think about that. There's a lot of confusion about Thunderbolt 3. I, I, I know a lot of people who have, uh, particularly this is a control strip, 15 inch Thunderbolt Mac. It's got two complete buses of Thunderbolt 3 in it. Uh, my 360 Spectre two Thunderbolt ports on it, but it's a single bus. 
But on the Max, you can actually do this. So I can drive, drive two 5K monitors plus do data at over a gigabyte a second on this computer that's sitting in front of me. That was unheard of a few years ago. We couldn't do a gigabyte a second data transfers. I mean, we're talking four or five years ago, that was still a relatively difficult thing to do. And now with Thunderbolt, we're pushing beyond that. I've seen speeds as high as you know, 2,600, 2,700 megabytes a second, 2.7 gigabytes a second on a mobile device that also has the underpinning for, for quality video and networking and everything else I need. And it interfaces with any device. Um, some of the cool Thunderbolt 3 tricks that people need to think about is, is that being an Apple guy, I, you know, I bought the Apple, like we call them dongles, Apple dongles. And what I found was is the, the, the Apple adapter for Thunderbolt 2 to Thunderbolt 3 actually is pretty universal. It doesn't pass DisplayPort. It's one of the issues with it. They know that. I bypass it by just going direct from USB-C into um, a DisplayPort adapter. But the cool thing of being able to have the Apple connector, and Lintas makes them, and StarTech makes them, and Aikido makes them, and all the, there's a number of manufacturers that make these Thunderbolt 2, Thunderbolt 3 adapters. The Apple one's bi-directional. The Apple one, you can plug into the back of a Lacy Big 12, which I have, I've got a couple of them, plug it in there and leave the dongle hanging off, and then plug my older Thunderbolt 2 systems into it, which allows me to use fiber optic cabling because that's not yet available for Thunderbolt 3. So I can actually enable my machine room the way I had before with Thunderbolt 3 devices by just adding, which until you know, the end of April is still $19, uh, the, the Apple adapters. And that's an important part of this because we have to move forward. And you may not want to buy the current computer because there, some people have some issues with the control strip mag. I know I have. Um, it took a bit to tweak it and make it one. I got one of the very first ones and it wasn't exactly what I wanted. But the reality of it is, is that now you can actually stick with your old devices and access the latest technology so that when you switch over to Thunderbolt 3, you just take the dongle off and plug directly in. Some issues about the cabling with Thunderbolt are interesting too because people need to understand there's lots of levels of cabling because the USB-C standard that plug that Thunderbolt uses is the same plug that's used for the USB 3.1.2 standard. That's the USB-C. The cabling could be passive. A passive Thunderbolt cable that's 40 gigabits can't be longer than half a meter. That's the limitation of a passive cable for Thunderbolt 3 at this time, half a meter. Active cables, a little more expensive, can run up to a meter and a half. I, 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 they, some people say two meters. I like to keep them just a little bit shorter than that. Um, I like to stay a little on the shorter side just because of consistency. The plug information in, in Thunderbolt 3 is important too. If you get a bare USB-C plug, it's a passive USB-C connection. It's USB 3.1.2, okay? If it has a lightning bolt on it, the Thunderbolt logo, lightning bolt, that means it's an active cable to 20 gigabits. So you get the same equivalent that you got over Thunderbolt 2. With Thunderbolt 3 cabling, it's got the lightning bolt and the number three on it. That's a 40 gigabit cable. They're gonna be a little bit more expensive. They're in the 50 to $60 range like the Apple cables were. They're not going to exceed two meters. Now think about that for a second. This was the same cabling conundrum we had with Thunderbolt. How do I do this? What do I do? And, and this ubiquity of that one connection confuses everyone. Well, is it USB or is it Thunderbolt? What am I gonna get? The simple thing to remember is if you have a Thunderbolt device, Mac or PC, don't care, and you stick a USB-C device into it, you get all of USB-C. But if you stick a Thunderbolt device in it, you get more. And the one secret that they don't tell you is it reverses power back in. On the Mac in particular, if you plugged into the Lacy, I have a Bolt Lacy or a Big 10, uh, Big 12, it actually feeds up to 15 watts of power back into your system. It trickle charges your laptop while you're plugged into your drives. Now on the PC side, it doesn't quite work the same way because not all of the PC manufacturers would allow trickle charging. 
Um, the, the, the specification for Thunderbolt 3 is that it passively sends up to 15 watts of power. And if it's an active connection for charging and stuff, it'll actually go up to 85 watts of power. The limit on the bus is 100, but most everybody stayed at the 85 watt level for now. The laptop, is, the Macs are 85 watts. The 13 uh, inch Mac is 45 watts, I think. So it, the devices change. Not all of the Windows machines accept that trickle charging. But what that means is, it's like, okay, I'm I'm working at home and I've got, you know, I've got my let's see Bolt drive, which is pretty high speed. I, you know, it does well over a gigabyte a second, uh, almost two gigs a second. So when I'm done and I, I like go take go to lunch or something, and I'll close my laptop to sleep it, I come back, my laptop would be fully charged while I'm working, just plugged into my storage. The other thing to think about is docking. Um, it's a simple way to get all the ports that you want. Some of the docks charge, some of them don't. And they're, they're, you know, they come from, um, I, have a, I have a StarTech, uh, the Belkin one's really nice, the Dell one works really, really well. Um, not all of them charge, and it was interesting, if you went on Amazon and you looked at, at you know, which one it is, you all of a sudden start seeing all the drives saying charging or non-charging, you know, power compatible, charging power on Windows only. So they've started divining on Amazon which of the devices actually have the ability to charge your laptop and control your other devices. But they pretty much work across the board. I mean, I use my Apple Thunderbolt 3 to Thunderbolt 2 connectors on Windows. I use my, you know, there's the AV adapter, which is lightning, HDMI, and USB on the little adapter. So I can actually charge my phone, get an HDMI signal out, and also, you know, have the clicker for my presentations when I run them. Thunderbolt's gotten to the point where once the Windows guys got involved, and the Windows people went whole hog, there's they're expecting there'll be 37 computers shipping by the end of this month with Thunderbolt 3 on them. And another 125 devices shipping with USB-C. Logic board devices, tablets, those kind of things with USB-C on them. Even there's one even, even some phone even has USB-C on it now. So this is the ubiquity of this plug, whether it's for the USB-C side, for the USB side, or for the Thunderbolt side, you have the power with Thunderbolt to do everything that it can. Now, and you think about this, like everything, it's like, what does that mean? It's like, well, it means two 4K monitors, one 5K monitor on each Thunderbolt bus that you have. So in theory, from this laptop in front of me, I could actually have four 4K monitors running with being able to play process data and everything else simultaneously and get full 10-bit color on all of them. That's a brave new world for us, especially as we talk about HDR. Because in high dynamic range imaging, it's big data for anybody. You know, you might think that you can stay there in ProRes, but when you start talking about working in, you know, red cameras, or you're talking Airy RAW or Sony RAW or Canon RAW, you're now processing a whole lot more data. And being able to maintain that data in a 10-bit color space gives you the power to do the next generation of your work to be the best performance artist you can be. And we don't think about it that way. We always, we're always concerned about, you know, what can I do to make my life better? Well, Thunderbolt does that for us because it makes it simpler. I can carry my simple laptop with me, I can work on a plane, I can get back to my office and I can plug in. Um, I have an Aikido node and I plug into it with a, a, an NVIDIA 1080p card, I have a GTX 1080p card. Plug it into it, activate the NVIDIA driver in the system as an external thing, and I get boosted performance over eGPU. So I'm actually doing an external GPU processing that could increase performance on certain aspects. Resolve is a perfect example of it. Um, I haven't done it with Resolve 14 yet. I did it with Resolve 12.5, but get 25 or 30% better performance in Resolve because of the GPU processing, and especially since Resolve really likes NVIDIA, the, the CUDA processing for NVIDIA. There's a couple little hacks you have to do for it, and you can actually go online and find those. But think about this. We're at a point in time where I can now make portability my life. Live in a way where I can you know, be relaxed and go on the beach or go by the pool or you know, go out in the yard and I'm with the kids and I can type and get, get everything I need to do done and build my projects 
and then take it back to my office and plug in and have the power in the rendering engine and the other devices in line already online in my system to be able to finish the project just like if I was working on a workstation. And that's where this is the change. And it's a watershed. And, um, and I've always talked about Thunderbolt as this process for big data because that's where everybody sees the advantage for Thunderbolt. I can move massive amounts of data in real time. You know, I, I, I kind of laugh. I have a, um, a large storage array in my office, about 850 terabytes. And I have a, a, a Thunderbolt 2 cable that goes down into the machine room. It's a, I have a long one. So I have a, you know, I plug it in. And anything I plug into that specific cable will automatically clone on my system. So I use it as, as, a, as a backup purpose. If I'm on set and I come home at night, you know, I'm just like late, I'm tired, I don't want to plug it, you know, fight with having to copy data to my network. I can just plug anything in and anything that attaches to this automatically clones on my system. Well, that becomes a new way to do it because now I'm starting to back up, you know, two or three terabytes at a pop and I can do that while I'm changing clothes or taking a shower after work, and I come back and the drive is empty now, it's been cloned on my system, and I can take that shuttle drive back into work. I can handle the data, I can move data from you know, VR projects where you've got 10 or 20 or 24 cards if you're using a jaunt system, where you can actually move the data from 24 simultaneous SD cards over a Thunderbolt and still have all the power that USB is underneath it. But understanding that, you know, with Thunderbolt, and it's just gonna get faster and faster, we're gonna start seeing, we're gonna see, start seeing more and more drives that hit that two gigabyte, 2.5 gigabyte line. Right now, pretty much all of the devices, unless you're doing something very special in RAID Zero, you're kind of limited to just under, you know, 1500 megabytes a second is pretty average on most system. For a write, the reads are well into two gigabytes a second. But it's just the, the caching systems on the drives haven't caught up to the technology that they're attached to. And understand that no matter whose manufacturer you use, whether it's, whether it's a LeC drive, whether it's a GTEC drive, whether you've got a Seagate product, whether you've got a Promise Array, it, I don't care. There are limitations based on the bus speed of each of your systems that's going to not allow you to get to the, to the greatest <coughs> speeds. That will change as more and more devices get on the market. And the price will come down as more and more devices are on the market. We're literally seeing hundreds of devices being turned in for certification at Intel on a regular basis. I, I, I heard the number that they expect to start certifying somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 devices a week in the near future. Palm drives, I mean, hand, hand storage. Somebody had, a, someone out in the lobby before the presentation here had a little tiny Seagate drive, a two terabyte drive. It was, um, I don't know, it was about, like six of them would have been the size of a pack of playing cards. That's what we're getting to. Smaller, lighter, faster, more efficient in a mobile environment that we want to be in. I mean, we all work on our phones, we all work on our tablets. Why can't we take that same technology into post? Why can't we take that same technology into production and then attach it to workstation level performance at our desks? This is why I like Thunderbolt. I mean, and, and I'm one of those guys who got in early on. It, it, it pretty much changed the way I work because start moving a gigabyte a second on a regular basis, or, you know, and that starts surprising everyone. And, and when you work on set like I do a lot of times, you, people forget that the um, slowest thing in the chain is the camera media. Pretty much the slowest thing I ever handle is the media that comes out of the camera. Most cameras, even the Reds and, and the Vision Research Phantom that I work with, the mags tap out at about six, 700 megabytes a second. They don't really go much faster than that. You don't have to because you're writing compressed files to it. You know, some of the codex mags can write faster because they're writing Airy RAW for Lexus 65 and all of that. There are some that go faster, but not many. And not regular. I mean, most SD cards barely write 200 megabytes a second. There are a few that do now. Um, so the readers aren't there. You, know, the, you don't have the ability at the acquisition point to utilize this unless you aggregate the media. In VR, we are aggregating the media where you've got five or six cards simultaneously offloading and the bus structure is stuff that it can actually take all of them at the fastest they can handle it. So you're handling this large volume of data from multiple cameras simultaneously fairly much, pretty much in real time. 
And that means you're saving money. Because the less time you're spending handling that, the more efficient you can be. And that's part of why all of this is important, because we are trying to build a new infrastructure. And it's a new medium. As we move farther and farther away from large facilities to independent producers, small studios producing content for the web and everyone else, it's, it's incumbent for the people that are doing that to find the workflows that fit for them. And too many people want to go into a small work group, you know, six or eight people in a shop working on something. They want to go back into the old world where, you, oh, I have to have infrastructure and I have to have all of that. Now you've got devices where you can actually just drop it in the machine room and activate it across your network in a simple fashion with the speed that you get from these devices and do everything you want to do. That's where I think it's fun for me to be here, and I thank the people at LumaForge for having me, because they're seeing it as innovation. They're understanding that the Thunderbolt attached workflow is going to allow them to help you solve your problems in post. Whether it's one or two people in a shop, or you have a whole facility, this interconnectivity of multiple types of devices is the future of post production. And as we go to, you know, regardless of what kind of product we go to, whether it's VR, whether it's you know, high dynamic range imaging, whether you're working in multiple GoPros, or you're just doing wedding videos, the time that it takes to move the files and handle the data is important. And I don't know about anybody else, but I've not ever been a fan of staring at a computer, spinning, moving data. You know, watching that bar crawl across the screen really, really slow. And then it'll stop for a real long time, just before it finishes. And you're waiting, and waiting, and waiting. And you don't see that anymore. It's a brave new world for us. And it enables just not, not just what we do, but what everyone around us can do too. And I like to remind people, there's like, the less time you spend on set, the more time you get to spend with your family. The less time you're moving data, the more time you get to play with the kids, or go look at the sun, or be outside and enjoy the world. And that's the message we have for you, is that Thunderbolt makes your life a little easier and a little faster.